Welcome back to the Technology in Science Barrington James podcast. Uh, my name is Toby and I am joined today with a very special guest. We are joined by Dave Saunders. Dave, pleasure to have you on today. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No, my, my pleasure. Um, yeah, so Dave, for those who don't know you, uh, who are you and what do you do? Sure. Um, well, uh, right now I'm um, co-founder and chief technology officer of Galen Robotics. And uh, we're one of the many surgical robotics companies out there. Um, but our particular focus is on uh, really narrow corridor uh, surgical procedures, uh, upper head and neck, where you're doing uh, what are called keyhole procedures, where you have just very restricted access to patient anatomy, like down the throat, behind the ear, um, you know, small openings in the brain. And I've uh, been working on that for a while, um, actually about 10 years in conjunction with uh, ongoing research at Johns Hopkins University, as well as the hospital. Um, before that, I've uh, done a couple other med tech startups. Um, I was also a research director at Lucent Bell Labs, um, where uh, uh, one of the groups that I worked with invented the original uh, implementation of Wi-Fi a little uh, thing that looked like a little flying saucer from Apple, uh, which was the first uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. We actually built that um, uh, in, in, in my group at Lucent. And before that, uh, um, I was um, my first dot com before we even knew to call it dot com. Uh, <laughs> we sold uh, we sold Telnet to defense contractors in the late 80s uh, as the uh, first commercial developer for Internet software for Macs and Windows. So. I've been a nerd for a long time. I really love, I, I love technology. And most importantly, I love how technology enables people to do things that they've never done before. And that's, that's always the, the thing that gets me jazzed up and, and excited. Uh, amazing. Yeah, really appreciate the, the introduction. Uh, obviously, you said it yourself that you've been working in, in technology for a long time now. But when it comes to sort of the medical devices and surgical robotics, what was it that really inspired you to get involved with that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I had been working on uh, another cloud company uh, back in like the like uh, 2010. And I got approached by a friend who was the CEO of another medical device company. And he told me there was a university that was working on some technology um, for uh, basically navigated uh, uh, total knee replacement surgery. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like a handheld robot. And so we worked on that technology, formed a company around it. Um, uh, it ended up, we had inventor syndrome. So, uh, you know, sometimes companies blow up, um, but, uh, but learned a lot from it. And then as I was uh, leaving that, uh, that company, um, I was approached by Johns Hopkins, uh, their technology ventures group that runs all their IP. And they said, um, uh, we, we know that you love to commercialize technologies. I've actually taken over 40 products to market um, in my career from inception to 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 market. So I, I, I love developing new products. And uh, so they, they said, we've got some technology to take a look at. Do you know who Russell Taylor is? And I'm like, I've got his baseball card. Um, for, for those who don't know, Russell Taylor is considered to be the father of surgical robotics. Um, he uh, was a, a manager at um, uh, IBM. In fact, he, uh, there are patents with his name on it for things like bit register shifts in CPUs. So if you think about like really hardcore computer science technology, Russ is actually the father of some of that too. Um, but he's also uh, the guy who really began to evangelize uh, the early use of medical devices uh, with embedded software, worked with SRI International, created what became the Da Vinci, implemented some of the key features that really make that a safe device for doing abdominal laparoscopic surgery. And in the 90s, he was recruited to Johns Hopkins and continued to, uh, he's got about 20 professors under him, working on all kinds of robotics, medical robotics research. And so he had this one project that he wanted to show us and it was driven by um, basically neurosurgeons and otolaryngology surgeons at the hospital who were just like, look, there are all these robots in the market, but we don't have one. We're the ones who are doing microsurgery, sometimes with instruments that are 30 centimeters long. And we're holding them back here. 
And then there's like a cutting tip or a forceps at the 30 centimeters away. And we're doing microsurgery on people's vocal cords and in their middle ears and in their brain and up their sinuses and resecting pituitary glands. You know, our heartbeat actually flicks the end of the instrument, limiting our dexterity. Why don't we have robotic technology? And so that was the inspiration that created um, this robot that we started working on. And so we, we signed a license, we formed a company, and um, we went through uh, about three uh, major prototype revisions. And then this past July, we got our FDA clearance for de novo um, uh, for this robot, making it the first mm -hmm. um, cooperatively controlled microsurgical robotic assistant um, in the world, which is pretty cool. And um, I have the I have the privilege of continuing to work with surgeons and researchers at Johns Hopkins who are just constantly motivated to be just looking at new ways to apply technology to move the line on either technology itself or clinical applications to reach into those surgeries that five years ago would have been science fiction. And they want to make science fiction surgeries reality. And so we're not just talking about like adults with upper head and neck, but we're talking about even mm -hmm. like fetuses still in the womb having surgery done on a 25 week old fetus to correct in some cases, incredibly debilitating life-threatening conditions, um, uh, birth defects, things like that. Imagine the, the conditions for doing surgery on a fetus that's still in the womb. Every bit of technology that you can bring to bear is going to turn that into a miracle surgery and ensure a consistent and predictive outcome. And that's really what surgical robotics is all about. And it's just, it's so much fun to me. And it's like, um, yeah, when we were approached uh, by it and when we got to, to see it and and the opportunity working with Johns Hopkins, it was like, well, how could I say no? It was, <laughs> it was definitely a labor of love. Oh, amazing, yeah. You can you can tell by just your your passion for for the industry. It's uh, yeah, amazing to see. Uh, one thing you mentioned there was getting to work with sort of the researchers at John Hopkins. Just how important do you think it is um, to actually collaborate with not not just sort of uh, universities and research institutions, but also hospitals and clinicians? It's it's absolutely critical. Um, you know, I, I think of like um, you know, uh, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, we have a relationship with the Midlands, and so often we've gone out there to to take a look at where the MRI was invented, right? And yeah. so what 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 did it take to make something like that possible? Not only a, a huge group of just you know over the top nerds that are going to develop technology that, you know, made you go, that can't be real, right? But you also had clinicians that could explain, no, this is why a CT scan isn't good enough. This is why cutting the patient isn't good enough. We need to be able to see this kind of imagery inside the body in real time. And having that kind of constant exposure to the clinicians to make sure that your ship stays aligned with the North Star is absolutely critical. And, um, you know, in, in, in the case of Johns Hopkins, there's a heavy incentive with the practitioners to always be actively researching, publishing. And so some of the surgeons that I work with, they are over at the university every single Wednesday providing hands-on feedback to not only my robot, uh, one of the prototypes is over there, but student projects, um, you know, there are surgeons over there that are providing constant, constant feedback because, you know, technology is cool, but if it's not going to really solve an actual problem, then it's never going to see the light of day. And so it, it is, it's absolutely critical. You've got to have that, that customer feedback, not only as early as possible, but constantly. Yeah, like like you say, that constant uh, relationship, having them and building those relationships. Um, also, sort of from a, a patient perspective as well, if they know that the, the clinician is is really knowledgeable or on the actual robot itself, it makes that uh, experience so much uh, easier for them. Um, yeah. uh, another area that you, you mentioned as well was sort of obtaining the, the FDA. Um, just sort of uh, talk, talk us through that process. It must be such a, a time-consuming one. It, it is. It's, it's really tough. And it, it's funny because, of course, I, I was in telco for a while as well, which is also heavily regulated. 
Um, and so when I moved from kind of that, that you know, Lucent telco world over to MedTech, I was already familiar with QMS. I've, I've run multiple QMS organizations. Um, so I kind of knew the framework of what I was getting into. Um, but it is tricky, um, you know, with, uh, with FDA or even with CE Mark in, in Europe, you know, it's, it's on me to prove that my device is safe and efficacious, but that's only the tip of the iceberg because you're going to assume that somebody's going to try to bring a product to market. That's going to help and not harm patients. Right. Let, let's assume that that's a given that nobody's going to be as mustache twistingly evil enough to go out there with a device that's intended to harm someone, right? So really what what the regulatory agencies want to see is they want to pull back the curtain and they want to say, they want to see, are you able to consistently justify everything that went into your product to make it what it is? And are you able to consistently demonstrate that you have a series of processes that allow you to replicate your product over and over again, so that what is coming off the assembly line and going into customers' hands is the same thing over and over again. And that is honestly more important than just the upfront, does it work, does it make surgery better, that sort of thing. That that really is actually assumed to be more or less a given. I mean, we had to provide plenty of data to get our clearance on that regard as well. Um, but but the real thing that I think is is the is the is the big hammer that the FDA holds is that at some point you will get audited and they will come in and they're and what they're going to look for is they're going to look at your records, your design history files, your design history records, and they're going to look at what are your standard operating procedures. Can we demonstrate that every engineer or person in manufacturing was trained on those? operating procedures before they began to apply them. Mm-hmm. Some there, there have actually been people who have failed audits because they had people who started working before they could demonstrate that they were formally trained on the SOP. And that's a big no-no. And so it's that kind of scrutiny that's really going to come to bear to make sure that you are a actual functioning quality driven organization. And when you look at the history of failures and recalls, it's almost always that's that's where the problem is. It's not some, oh my gosh, we didn't realize that this device worked this way in the field. It's it's almost never that. It's almost always, you know, well, we just checked this code in for this embedded software and we just kind of assumed that a couple of these tests were given and V and V didn't get to take a look at it and that sort of thing. It's it's in those areas where the screw ups almost always are. Yeah, and obviously, um, such a big uh, hurdle for a company to get over to get their their robots uh, FDA approved or C marked here in Europe. Um, would you say that's probably the biggest challenge that uh, companies face in trying to actually uh, make a successful robot? It is. It's a it's a lot of work. You know, um, we obviously because of our close relationship with Johns Hopkins, we we had a, a very seasoned senior staff, but we also wanted to hire a lot of these graduates that were coming up through Dr. Russell Taylor's group at Johns Hopkins. These are people who knew the robot as students, the prototypes anyway, they're well-trained, but not necessarily job ready. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so we brought them into the organization and we had to teach them those, those aspects of the job and they're very important to have. And so, um, they would be a bit of a struggle. You know, if you, I don't know if you've ever done computer coding on your own or anything like that, but where where do you get started? I mean, even take, take computer coding out of it. Just think about writing a letter. Do you yeah. sit there? Like if you're going to write a letter to grandma, do you sit there and actually write a proper outline and then, then go a little bit deeper in your outline and then write your abstract statement for grandma you know, do you go through those formal processes of writing like you would for a research paper? Probably not. And the average computer programmer, especially the self-taught ones, and that's the majority these days, they just dive in and start hammering out code. Oh, it kind yeah. of works. Write some more. Ooh, it still works. Everything's. And they don't go through this formal process of actually saying, 
this is what I intended to do. This is the logic this code is going to follow through. And so they end up not having that foundation of being able to demonstrate this is what the code was supposed to do in the first place, right? It just kind of grows organically. And hardware can do the same thing. It's real easy for a, a, a master's or a PhD in engineering to pop open a McMaster's catalog. You see, mm. uh, oh, hey, here's the linear actuators. And oh, here's a couple, oh, these motors look like they're the right spec. And you just order a bunch of parts, extrusion rail. Next thing you know, you've got you know 90% a, a of a functioning device. Everything moves around like it's supposed to. How close are you really? Right. And so it's it's really learning that discipline, but also learning that that discipline doesn't take away creativity. It doesn't take away your ability to be a good engineer. In fact, if you learn how to do those processes correctly, they actually make you a better engineer. They make you a more creative engineer. Mm -hmm. And you, you'll you'll you, you invariably will see younger and less experienced engineers struggle and in some cases fight um, following those processes. And then they just, they hit this little weird inflection point and then suddenly everything clicks in their head and they go, Oh, that actually does make everything easier. But yeah. it's, it's, you know, if, if only you could just look, put that inflection book in, or that inflection point in a textbook and just convince them of it early enough on, but they had, they have to like get it in their head and just something suddenly clicks. And then they're like, Oh, and it's very gratifying to see, you know, people who were brand new hires, their first ever job, they came into Galen and now they're running entire teams and you see them actually teaching elements of QMS systems to other new hires and you can see that they get it. And it's, it's a great, it's a great thing to see. Yeah, no, it sounds, it sounds extremely rewarding. Um, I guess uh, one thing you mentioned in there was sort of code and, and software Obviously, we're in uh, sort of the AI revolution, so to speak, at the moment. Just how important do you think AI is when it comes to surgical robots? And uh, obviously, not just now, but for the future as well. Um, in the future, I can see it really uh, being beneficial. Here's the problem today. I go to chat GTP and I can do some amazing things. In fact, I've, I've actually, just as a personal challenge, at home, I'll occasionally come up with like stupid pet trick ideas and I'll be like, okay, I'm only going to let ChatGTP write the code to do this. So just for example, um, in my calendar, I had all these birthday items that were set to busy for some reason. So they're all day events, but they're set to busy and they're screwing up my time blocking software because it tries to automatically schedule events for a particular day that it thinks is is busy because of a birthday. So I went to ChatGTP and I said, write me a script that can go through the Google API, go through every single all day event. And if it is a birthday and if it is busy, set it to free. And it took about five iterations to work the bugs out, but I never wrote a single line of code. ChatGTP eventually gave me a fully working uh, uh, app that ran through the Google API. It even told me how to set up the Google API in case I didn't know. And the whole thing ran successfully. And that is amazing. And there's a lot of tasks where those things can be done. Now, the downside is those are tasks that you would usually give the junior programmers to cut their teeth on. So mm. if that stuff becomes super easy for a GPT, how do you become a good programmer if all of those little nerdy tasks get taken away from you. So that's that's another problem. But when we then start to look at what surgical robotics need to do, um, we start to deal with kinematics and we start to deal with really complex math. Um, my robot, instead of being something called a serial arm, which is a, a many jointed arm, um, mm. and so that's the serial part, um, my robot is based on something called a delta, which actually has multiple motors running in parallel to move um, the robot arm itself. And so the kinematic um, math is actually quite different than what you would use uh, with a serial arm. And so there are multiple parameters that you have to understand, the, the pitch of the linear actuators, the torque of the motor, all this kind of stuff you have to have an understanding of to write the code for. I don't know how to describe that kind of stuff to a GPT today, right? Now, 
five years from now, shit, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> a year from now, um, who knows? I mean, we might see, um, I, in fact, I've re been reading articles recently about one of the scary things about GPTs is they're starting to actually get good at math. Yeah. And one of the concerns is what happens when they start inventing new forms of math that human beings don't understand? And will it be able to invent new forms of cryptography? I mean, this is how Skynet happens, right? So, um, so there, 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 there are potentials where eventually it could become good enough at those, those incredibly intricate motor controls and things like that, that it could be mm -hmm. developing very viable chunks of code. Regardless, though, today, I could be using GPT to generate UX code. There's, there's tons of mundane code. Um, I could be doing code reviews. Um, I think you should always have a human do, being do a code review. But I haven't done this yet, but I've been toying with the idea of what if I took a chunk of code, fed it to a GPT, and said, you're a master code reviewer, critique this code for efficiency, execution, point out any potential errors, um, inconsistencies in logic. Um, it could be another vote for for a code review, it could potentially find bugs that human beings, because of whatever biases, we might just miss. Um, and so there's there's an incredible amount of utility just sitting there. Um, today, um, I would not want to tell any regulatory body that I used GPT, and I haven't, so I just want to make that clear. Um, but, but even if I did, I would not... I, I think I'd be a little hesitant to to tell um, a regulatory body that I took something with the brain of a six year old, you know, all the knowledge of the internet, but really the logical brain of a six year old, and I let it, you know, uh, you know, build a navigation system for for doing somebody's knee. I, I don't think I think the regulatory bodies wouldn't wouldn't let me through the door if I did that, and and I don't think it'd be responsible today to do either, but we're getting close. And there are, and that's and that's code generation, and so that's that's important. But there are other applications for AI that I think are critical for surgical robotics. Mm -hmm. um, another one of them is, for example, um, if we're going to do middle ear surgery, the first sixty to ninety minutes of, of middle ear surgery is I've got to take a an eighty thousand RPM Dremel tool, and I've got to grind through the mastoid bone behind the human ear, it's the hardest bone in the human body and it is the shortest path to the middle ear. So I'm gonna grind through this thing and basically uh, drill a path to the middle ear. Embedded in the bone right where I need to be drilling are two facial nerves, a bunch of blood vessels, and depending on patient anatomy, I could be maybe a millimeter away from plunging down into the dura and causing a brain injury when I'm supposed to just be doing, you know, a cochlear implant or something, right? So it's an extremely risky portion of the surgery. Um, CT scans cannot pick up those nerves. They're embedded in the bone. If you're a really, really good practitioner, I mean, really, really good, you can kind of look at it and you can go, I think I can kind of see ghostly where those nerves are, at least I have an idea, right? And so you'll kind of decide your approach based on that. We have shown in research that a, an, a machine learning algorithm can actually be taught to take an entire CT scan of a patient's skull and actually identify all of the individual temporal bones and the soft tissue objects where, and then we could potentially build virtual fixtures to ensure patient safety, which would allow you to, one, drill more quickly, 60 to 90 minutes of a patient under anesthesia, just to get access to the middle ear is a long, long time. Um, if we could actually have reasonable virtual fixtures around those anatomical structures, that could be 20 minutes of bone drilling instead of 60 to 90. Mm, that's yeah. a huge, that's a monetary savings. It's a patient safety savings. It's also a hand fatigue savings from the surgeon standpoint. Everybody wins. That's a huge thing. 
that technology benefit right there could be massive. Another area is um, navigation for something like transthenoidal surgery. I'm trying to go up into the patient's sinuses, dig away sinus tissue, eventually start cutting through some of the bone to get access to the pituitary gland. Traditional surgical navigation does not work. And there's a bunch of reasons we could do a whole episode why it doesn't work, but it doesn't work. Um, and so what you need are new forms of navigation technology, perhaps that utilize the endoscope and the camera that is right there where you're actually doing the surgery. What if you could actually integrate your surgical robot with the endoscope and actually devise a new form of navigation through that endoscope and be able to register all that patient's anatomy in real time and then do surgical navigation, potentially virtual fixtures, all of that right there. Um, and that combines machine learning. It combines computer vision. And keep in mind, these endoscopes, these are like 4K resolution endoscopes these days. Those are the low end ones, right? So you've got plenty of computer You've got plenty of, of resolution for computer vision. You've got pl plenty of computing power. I'm doing experiments at the university on like five and six-year-old student laptops, and they're almost real time in terms of performance. Mm. So imagine what we could do if we actually put a real like NVIDIA 4090 into yeah. a surgical robot and just gave it like a monster GPU to 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 handle that that kind of that kind of uh, uh, processing, I, I think I think the things that we can effectively do that are not just cool technology for technology's sake, but real benefits to the hospital to the payers because even in a single payer system, somebody's paying bills, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, right across the board, every single stakeholder in a surgery will be benefited by the correct applications of computer vision and machine learning in surgical robotics. And we're seeing evidence of that today. We don't have a lot of implementations in the field. And one of the reasons for that is regulatory. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new frontier, right? So regulatory is very correctly looking at that stuff, you know, a little, little side-eyed. And so it is going to be difficult to get some of the initial um, machine learning based surgical robotic features into the market. There's, there's extra scrutiny involved, but once they're in there, I think we're going to almost immediately be able to see clear and demonstrable benefits because of those applications. So I, I think, I think the next 10 years for surgical robotics is, you know, you go back to this video 10 years from now yeah. and you're going to be going, well, of course we're going to do that, right? But <laughs> we'll, we're ten years from now. For for me today, we're talking about stuff that is is on science fiction movies and TV shows today, and it's going to be very attainable. And it's ten years, and it's not just and that's not just one of those. Oh, everything is ten years away. We're really on the cusp. Where we're able to do it today. It's just from a regulatory and safety standpoint, I don't think that technology will be fully vetted and in the field for another 10 years, but we know it works today. We can see it work. That's I think that's amazing. Yeah, this certainly is amazing. And sort of just the, the, the technological developments over the last few years have been, been incredible. And to think we've got this technology now, where's that technology going to be in 10 years? I mean, the, the possibilities really are endless. Oh yeah, you know I I am one of the uh, uh, previous technology that I worked on. Um, we we took a striker um, sagittal saw for for doing knees, yeah. and we mounted a navigation system, a mobile platform navigation system, to the sagittal saw. And the initial prototype, we basically went to Target bought a couple Microsoft 1080p webcams, ripped the optics out of them. And we actually used that to assemble um, the initial prototype. And we got all of the performance that we were looking for with off the shelf CCD, you know, uh, cameras from, yeah. from, you know, consumer grade webcams. And what the, the, the point of, of that is the technologies that are available off the shelf today, make 
just amazing things possible. I mean, when we were doing that project, which I guess was like 12, 13 years ago at this point, um, we were using at the time state of the art Arduino as a controller for yeah. those webcam interfaces. The Arduinos that are available today, the Raspberry Pis that are available today are a quarter the size and a hundred times more powerful. So off the shelf components are enabling not only incredible student research, but you know, um, med tech development is now accelerated because this is all available um, for computer vision, open CV, it's, it's open source and it works great. Um, LLMs are not just the domain of, of open AI, but I can go and install Llama 2 today on my Mac and my Windows. In fact, it's actually installing downstairs on my Windows machine. Um, I'm going to have to stop playing Overwatch, I guess, so I can play with Llama. And um, uh, um, uh, Microsoft just announced to the developers uh, this week an edge-based computing version of Phi 2, which mm. is another one. of the, It's a 2.8 billion parameter model. Um, I guess it's a, a small LLM, S L L I don't know. Um, it's a, you know, but it's, it's a personal assistant module that you can run locally. You don't have to run this stuff in the cloud. At some point, I'm hoping that Apple, based on some of the things that Apple has been releasing lately, like the, um, the native version of, um, MXL, um, I'm, I am predicting that we're going to see an LLM based version of Siri. Um, yeah. in the near future. And when that happens, it's going to blow our minds. I mean, whether you're an Android user or an iPhone user, or you've got some obscure smartphone or whatever, they're amazing today, right? I mean, we are the Borg. Um, but when you've got a voice activated, fully functional local computing LLM in your hand, <laughs> I just, I, it just, it really, really blows my mind what is going to be possible. And it's 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 great because we all win. Um, I mean, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom and and uh you know, people talk about, you know, Asimov and the laws of robotics and and uh you know, are we gonna go Skynet or you know, is uh you know Q star gonna kill us all and that kind of stuff? And hey, those are great discussions to have, but at the same time. The, what we have today is technology that can truly make a difference in our lives in the most amazing of ways. People that would have been turned away by anybody other than like Dr. Strange in the movie before he had his car accident, you know, oh, I only want this procedure, right? Those procedures that were only going to somebody like him eventually become commonplace because surgical robotics, and not that I'm saying that, you know, there are bad surgeons out there, but there are surgeons who just, they don't have the magical hands or they don't have just that extra little, you know, bit ability to reach into some of these just crazy, you know, miracle surgeries. But when you start to put technology in their hands that can effectively assist them in those areas, suddenly you've got a larger surgical population that is consistently turning out miracles day after day after day. That's a huge thing. That's a huge, huge thing. And that's, and that's, and that's my, and that's my driver. You know, <clears throat> when I look at this kind of technology, it's really about, I want to see this true democratization of med tech and surgical robotic technologies. I truly want to see technology merge with humans. I don't believe that robots should be replacing humans. If I'm, I'm not one of those guys. Yeah. Um but I believe that if you bring two technologies together, chocolate plus peanut butter is my favorite candy in the world. And um, you do that metaphorically and you create solutions that were impossible with only one of the things. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that I really, really, uh, I, I'm seeing today. I'm seeing evidence of those procedures happen now. And and, the, and it's really mind boggling to think that in, you know, five to 10 years, we're going to have, well, we're already seeing this with the Da Vinci, right? Yeah. The, uh, pros the nerve sparing prostatectomy. Um, I know CMR is, is a, is a, a big uh, yeah. uh, uh, provider of that procedure as well. Um, 
that procedure was developed as a manual laparoscopic procedure at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Okay. It wasn't invented by the surgical robotic people. It was invented as a manual laparoscopic procedure. And it was only performed by maybe a dozen surgeons because it is so technically difficult to do. Nobody mm -hmm. really wants to do it manually. In the state of California, the last time I looked at these numbers, the state of California, there's over 3,000 mm -hmm. surgeons that are uh, certified to do that procedure on the, 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 you know, the big 800 pound gorilla surgical robot out there. And I mean, that that's a game changer. I mean, I don't know if you, you know a lot about prostatectomies. If you're ever unfortunate enough to have to have one of those, the only way you can have normal function after the prostatectomy is if that nerve is spared. With an open surgical procedure for a prostatectomy, there is no possible way to spare that nerve. The mm. only way that it can be done is through laparoscopic surgery, right? So your options are, there's maybe a dozen manual laparoscopic surgeons that can do it, maybe as well as the robot. How long is their waiting list, right? Or there are literally thousands of Da Vinci, CMR, and uh, what, Hugo's coming out. Whatever the, you know, the, the all those, you know, there, there's like what, like a half dozen of these of these laparoscopic surgical robots coming to market. And any one of those can be used to do your nerve sparing prostatectomy procedure. Safely, consistently, day in, day out, as boring as a tax audit. And that's how surgery should be. Mm. And I think that's an amazing thing. And that's what we want to see technology applied for. And, and I mean, it, you go all over the body and you've got that air. Most people don't think of LASIK as a surgical robot, but that's exactly what it is. Mm. It's a surgical robot that, that tracks your eye movements because they don't want to you know, put you out that much, right? Yeah. And it you know, shoots the little laser to, to cause the scars to improve your vision, right? Before LASIK, you had surgeons with diamond-tipped scalpels that actually did that, it was called a PRK, and they did that surgery manually. Okay, so if you want LASIK surgery to fix your eyes, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose LASIK with a surgical robot, or do you want to have an old-school surgeon whip out a diamond tip scalpel and do it the good old fashioned way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> who, who chooses PRK, right? I'm, I'm sure somebody out there still does. There, there could be medical reasons why LASIK can't do it in some cases, but 99% of the people around the world are choosing LASIK. Right. And, and we, and we're going to see that throughout the surgical robotic field over and over. If you're getting a knee replaced, if you're getting a hip replaced, why would you want a random, I'm sorry, not a random dude. Why, why, why would you want a, a, a surgeon to nail a cutting jig into the end of your knee and then cut a, uh, then, you know, ram a sagittal saw through the slots to, to cut those holes or the, to, to cut those planes uh, to prepare your knee for an implant when a surgical robot can do that with incredible precision, incredible consistency. You as a patient are still treated by your surgeon. The surgeon is still there as the quarterback calling every single shot. Your medical mm. care should still be under a human's guidance. But that, but that, that portion that incidentally, if you're a couple degrees off when you prepare the knee for receiving the implant, you're going to walk with a weird gait for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right. Just a just a degree or two uh being off, right? But the robot already has a 3D model of your bone that, you know, before it even opens it up, it knows exactly what that surgical plan is. It's going to align um to the anatomy of your knee, not anybody else's knee, not a generic knee, but your knee. And it's going to put that um all those cuts exactly where they're supposed to go consistent day in day out as boring as it comes and that's the way it should be and um again i just you know this is where the technology this is what we want the technology to be it's cool but we also want it to be boring right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's got to be both um because that's you know nobody nobody wants to have the most exciting surgery in the world right that's that's not that's not what you're going for you want the most routine possible procedure 
no matter what it is that you're having. And technology makes that possible when it's applied correctly. Exactly, yeah, and obviously allows the surgeons to have sort of less uh, strain on their bodies doing the doing all the procedures manually, uh, faster recovery times, and all that sort of thing for the patients as well. So yeah, there's uh, definitely a lot to things be like pedicle, about. things like pedicle screws for doing spine fusion. Um, I know spine surgeons that are uh, that have just recently retired in their mid forties because they blew out their rotator cuff, but for using the pedicle screwdriver. And why isn't a robot holding that thing? There in fact are eight surgical robots on the market today, just for doing spine fusion. Um, not only do they reduce the stress and um, you know repetitive stress and strain on the surgeon, but they also allow for things like pedicle screw alignment under X-ray when the surgeon's in another room. Because if you ever look at the health stats for cancer rates among spine surgeons, it's a little high. And the reason for that is you can only put so many lead garments on while you're trying to take a shot in the OR to make sure that that pedicle screw alignment is correct before you drive it in. Um, mm. ro if, 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 if there was only one benefit to spine robots, it's to allow the surgeon to leave the room when the x-ray gets turned on so they can verify the alignment of the screw, make sure it's going in the right place, come back in. The robot, you know, is stiffly holding, you know, the, the screw in, in perfect alignment. So now all you have to do is complete the, you know, complete the insertion. Um, that's a huge benefit right there. Um, and there, you know, obviously there are more to it than that, but there are a lot of health benefits uh, of, of surgical robots um, to the surgeons in terms of repetitive stress injury, um, radiation exposure, and all those sorts of things. So yeah, there's 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 uh, there's benefits all over the place. Yeah, no, def definitely. Um, one thing I did want to actually mention to you, Dave. Obviously, uh, I saw on your LinkedIn that you've actually been named as sort of one of the the twenty four medtech voices to follow in twenty twenty four. Uh, really exciting. <laughs> Congratulations. It's a, it's a great honor. I love the MDDI group. Um, you know, they've got uh, a number of, of conferences throughout the United States and I've spoken on stage for them uh, several times. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be recognized. Um, this is, this is uh, a field that I, I feel very passionately about. I think there's an incredible amount of benefit um, and I think I also bring in a funny, um, well, I, I am entertaining, I hope. Um, but I also do think that because of my IT background coming from the internet, um, uh, I do bring in a different kind of, of experience um, into med tech that people who started in this industry don't have in the same way. And so, um, for example, I look at robots as computer interfaces. Mm. Um, and so when I think of her, you know, you, you look at the robot, you see like this big nifty physical thing, and maybe it's got racing stripes on it or whatever. Um, what I look at it is as, is just another interface to a computer. Yeah. And so for example, with my specific robot, it is a, it is cooperatively controlled, which means that the robot and the surgeon are simultaneously holding the instrument at the same time. And so as the surgeon is directing the motion of the instrument, the robot is recording all of those hand motions. And as we're integrating the robot with pure vision through the surgical microscope or the endoscope or whatever the surgeon happens to be using, I can now correlate all of those motions with the patient anatomy. I can see disease states. I can do augmented reality, highlight tumors. All those sorts of things are going to be possible in the future um, based on the research that we're working on. But all of that is 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 because you have this direct interface to the computer that's inside the robot and the robot is basically providing that that interface and when you look at it that way instead of just the robot being this mechanical thing that does some particular kind of surgery it really opens up the whole notion of why data collection and big data and machine mm -hmm. learning are such incredible opportunities in med tech because these devices are right there where the practitioner and the patient are, and they're collecting data in a time zero fashion that has never been collected before. 
I mean, you think about like, how did people learn surgeries a hundred years ago? You sat in the theater, you know, yeah. around the OR and you watched and your ability to learn was based on, you know, the, the acuity of your vision and whether or not you had a good seat. Right. <laughs> and now we have this ability to, I can actually record the hand motions of a surgeon. I can actually compare the efficiency of hand motion between two surgeons. And I can actually play those things back. Um, I can take a CT scan of a patient's skull and I can do a trial run of a mastoidectomy or any type of craniotomy. And I can actually allow the surgeon um, to actually feel resistance through the robot and actually get that feel. Um, you can only find so many cadavers with a particular kind of disease state to mm. train surgeons on. And, and if it's, and if it involves bone cutting, well, that only gets done once. But when, as I start to build a library of patient data and disease data in the robot, I now have the ability to train and simulate and, and replay and grade um, surgical performance. And that opens all kinds of crazy doors. Yeah, no, amazing. And uh, you definitely have been entertaining, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It's, uh, I really, really appreciate all the knowledge that uh, sort of you've you brought to the podcast here today. Um, I guess the future, what does it look like for yourself and also for, for Garland Robotics? Um, well, uh, we got our first clearance in July, and now we're looking to expand uh, the use of the surgical robot. It was designed to hold a variety of instruments, so we're looking at um, applications uh, for otology, neurosurgery, spine surgery, um, mm -hmm. fetal surgery, even cardiothoracic. Um, it sounds like a lot, but you know, as I was mentioning earlier, there are a lot of procedures where you just have one single incision and all of your instruments are really long and they're all going right through that one incision. And those kinds of procedures are all over the body and they're not laparoscopic procedures. And so they don't really lend themselves well to those laparoscopic robots. They require a different set of requirements. And I think uh, this robot really uniquely um, follows that. So um, a lot of cool applications for Galen, um, but I also am really looking forward to um, driving and influencing a lot of research um, here with Johns Hopkins um, to see where we can really take computer vision and machine learning mm -hmm. and really um, develop the next level of surgical techniques and surgical approaches and, and really begin to change things. Amazing. Well, I'm sure you'll be very successful in, in that and that the, uh, that the robot that you're working on will become sort of a, uh, a, a mainstream uh, mainstream robot for the surgeons. Um, so, Look, Dave, if, if people want to learn a little bit more about Garland Robotics, where would be best for them to, to find out? Uh, the website is galenrobotics.com. And of course, anybody is welcome to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, let's say it's linkedin.com slash in slash nemoc n-e-m-o-c-k and uh so i'm i'm always out there and posting so uh feel free to drop by and say hi uh, amazing yeah i'll uh definitely share with this one on my uh linkedin as well and get people to to follow you and uh yeah really appreciate uh your, your time today and uh, it's been really really eye-opening and eye-opening and uh yeah great to learn a little bit more about the industry from uh from an expert from within well thank you so much it was great having you, or great, great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, look, Dave, uh, have a, a great uh, rest of the year and uh, a good Christmas period. And uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, hopefully catching up again soon. You bet. You too. Excellent. Well, that's it for another episode of the Baron right. Games Technology and Science podcast. Thank you all for listening and looking forward to seeing you next time.